Jo. Äh, hi, <lacht> Silihun am ähm, Start. Äh, ich erstmal dieses Huhn hier. Oh, ich habe gar keinen Soundtest gemacht heute. Das ist natürlich kritisch. Ähm, in den letzten Videos hat man immer recht gut verstanden, was im Video vorkam. Naja, also, let's go. Wir pumpen heute DEFCON 23 von Satoshi Sassivili and Wang. Sorry on the pronunciation at this point. Uh, dann haben wir hier Angry Hacking, the next gen of binary analysis von 2015 ist es. Um, ja genau, wir spielen mal wieder auf Lasergurkenland, dem öffentlichen Anarchie Vanilla Server mit der IP 1492012127134 und let's get started. Ich hoffe man hört was vom Video, weil ähm, ja. Oh, ich, ähm, ja, ich muss noch kurz Sache. Und wir haben ein paar ja, ich crank mal den Sound ein bisschen ab, so dass mir gerade die Ohren nicht weggeblasen werden. So, seid ihr schon hyped? Ne? Seid ihr hyped? Ja. So, wir sind Shellfish. Shellfish is a TTF team. You can go check us out. We're playing the TTF right now on the uh, death on floor there. Uh, we're, uh, Was ist Shellfish ein Team? Ich habe irgendwie schon mal davon gehört. Aber keine Ahnung. Ist auch so ein familiar term. Okay, das ist vielleicht. Ja, ist ein Team, so wie es sich anhört. Also in der Rüstung ist auch bald am Arsch, habe ich das Gefühl. Bruder, wie lange will der noch über sein Team reden? Ich überlege gerade echt vorzuspulen. No hate an deren Team an der Stelle, aber das merke ich mir noch eh nie. Okay. Okay. So, let's go. Wollen ja auch ein bisschen Content hier noch rüberbringen, oder Leute? Was sagt ihr dazu? Und 
Bruder. Wie kommt ihr hier hin? Oh, Anger ist ein Tool. Das ist auch irgendwie mir vorbeigegangen gerade. No shit. Ist der tatsächlich noch aufgetaucht? Das ist ja crazy. Ah, fuck. wieder so ein Werbetalk uh, über irgendein so Tool. Uh, ist Anger überhaupt Open Source? Gibt es dieses Tool überhaupt noch? I don't know. Okay, also... Sorry Leute, aber den Talk breche ich ab. Das scheint irgendwie nur so ein Werbetalk für irgendein so ein Tool zu sein, was ich jetzt gerade nicht finde und dementsprechend desinteressiert bin. Okay. Äh, dann, ja, DLL Hijacking und OS X. Ähm, ja, hier, der klingt doch schön äh, flutschig. Dann ähm, pumpen wir jetzt. Defcon 24 von 2016, Jay Bale and Larry Pesch, Fishing without failure and frustration. Ja, um, yeah. also let's get started. Good afternoon. Welcome to Fishing without failure, or frustration for that matter, or how I learned to stop worrying and love a layer 8, otherwise known as 11 stories of fail. Oh mein Gott, sind das viele Titel. Brought to you by <lacht> Jay Neal, Larry Pesci. Yay. <lacht> Unangenehm. Welcome to day whatever of DEF CON. Um, some of you, this may actually be a continuation of yesterday because you haven't slept yet. Okay. Or some of you, you got lots of sleep, right? Who got lots of sleep? Lies. <lacht> Lies. 
if you see anybody wandering around and kind of looking, uh, if you could either choose one of two tips, either ignore them fully, like just, I would stare right over their shoulder, menacing growl, let them know that there's no way they're getting a seat, or, well, uh, let's go for the second option. Please uh, scoot in, make room, uh, pull your legs back, uh, make friends. Hopefully you all shower today. <laughs> nope. Okay, all right. <laughs> yep, I did. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about some uh, some fishing without failure and frustration. So as as us, for, for Jay and I and, and the In Guardians crew, um, this stuff for fishing should be really easy. Um, from the technical side, you create a really witty or crafty email that sends the readers to a, a, a website with some URL. Um, you set the website up. I mean, this is easy. You do Apache on Linux. It takes you about 10 minutes to do. It's wonderful. You, you build a one form page really crappy with H1 tags and blink and marquee and we collect credentials. We get kind approvals, that's one and two, and we send that email to as many email addresses as we can possibly find. And you watch the passwords fly in. Yeah. And it's, you get eh, 10 to 40% of the employees in most cases. And, uh, oh, das habe ich jetzt nicht gehört. Das hat sich schon gut angehört nach Fishing. So, ich muss ein bisschen zurückspulen. Bruder! Wie lange habe ich dir nicht mehr zugehört? Ah, das ist ein bisschen zu weit. And blink and marquee and we collect credentials. We get kind approvals, that's one and two, and we send that email to as many email addresses that we can possibly find. And you watch the passwords fly in. Yeah. And it's you get eh, 10 to 40 percent of the employees. Ja, das habe ich wieder nicht aufgepasst. And, uh, Wie hat der denn die uh, Webseite gespreadet? Here's to a, a, a website. Fishing should be really easy. Sorry. Um, for the technical side, you create a really witty or crafty email that sends the readers to a, a, a website with ah, okay, some URL. Email. Mm -hmm. um, you set the website up. I mean, this is easy. You do Apache on Linux. It takes you about 10 minutes to do. It's wonderful. You, you build a one form page really crappy with H1 tags and blink and marquee and we collect credentials. We get kind approvals. That's one and two. And We send that email to as many email addresses that we can possibly find. And you watch the passwords fly in. Yeah. And it's, you get eh, 10 to 40% of the employees in most cases. And uh, sometimes you get lucky and it really is this evening. Yeah. And now our job is done, right? So thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> that's how you do fishing without frustration. No. Welcome to fishing. This is all there is to it. No, it doesn't work that way. It'd be nice if it did. Sometimes you get really lucky. However, sometimes you get really, really lucky. Larry Pesci here uh, once had a fishing campaign with a success rate of more than 100%. He sent an email out to some number of employees of the company. Like more than 100, GG. And uh, he had the, the, the routine scary email that has all the things he needs to have. It has to have a call to action. That call to action has to say bad things will happen otherwise or engage you to be helpful and has to give a nice, nice deadline, right? So he crapped that email great and, uh, and it scared people hardcore. So they forwarded that email. The people who got it and their, and their colleagues haven't gotten it, they forwarded it over to them too. They're like, dude, you have to do this or else your access is gonna get cut off. And then, but I didn't get that email. Can you forward it to me? Send your copy. Um, and the people who were sending copies out actually sent copies out to their uh, out, out to their other accounts. So a lot of us, a lot of us, you know, we've got our we've got our normal user account, we've got our admin account, and then we've got our domain admin account. And so you you got it on one of the three, you sent it to the other two, and just to make sure that Larry gets domain admin passwords. Good job. It worked out really well. I hope everybody, I hope I'm not too old uh, and uh, everyone does recognize NXS, uh, our grades no. NXS, 100%. You're, too, you're too old. You're too old. So am I. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So the intent for doing the fishing to begin, we probably don't need to tell a lot of you, but to, to make sure we're covering all of our bases, we're here to try to do this fish to, quote, make the organization staff hard-ass mofos, right? We're trying to build the firewall of the human, right? We're trying to train the users to be better at this so that they don't click on stuff. Okay. And this stuff works after, a, you know, after, you, after you get through your second or third time getting, you know, finding out that you got caught by a fish, you tend to be a heck of a lot better. You're, you're a little gun shy. Right? Yeah. Yeah, if you start looking at every one of those emails rather critically and going, is this real or not? And sometimes the fishes are so good you wet you question. Uh, I, I have actually seen some folks send me some sample phishing emails and almost clicked on them because they were that good. <laughs> uh, why did I just get an email from FedEx? I know I'm waiting for a FedEx package. Uh, no, don't, don't click that. So it, it's about hardening the humans and not necessarily testing the technology to prevent it from getting in the organization in the first place. Now the problem is that most people's, if you're, so we're taking the, we're taking the perspective that you are either a consultant like us or you're in your own organization, you're trying to get a phishing program going to hard your users. Yeah. Which ultimately, oh my God, that's so blurred. In your own organization. Mm. Uh, so when we say clients, we mean potential clients that we work with from a consulting perspective, or you are in fact having your users and your organization be your clients. You are working within your department and your management and you are a client of that management staff. When I was internal, I like to think of myself as, well, I still think of myself as a consultant. Um, I still, I like to think of myself as having clients because I, I got me to understand who I was trying to serve. Um, okay, so most people's attempts don't go this well. Uh, years ago, when Bernie started doing more regular fishing work, we were doing it often. Uh, we watched our consultants get so frustrated with the situation when they were when they were fishing, and, uh, and we got better. So we, the rest of this talk is talking about all the frustrating situations that we and others ran into and trying to tell you, teach you how to avoid them yourselves so you can just have fun because fishing when it goes well is really, really fun. Get the passwords, hard the users, make everybody happy, this is awesome. Um, but for most people, their first attempt or two or three ends up being frustrating in a way that leaves them blaming their client, blaming themselves, frustrated, and um, even though they get technical success, uh, they end up just saying, oh, I hope I don't have to do that again. All right, so we're taking the approach of more of a pen test type of uh, scenario here. This isn't about uh, the, the red team, uh, the red team is the quote who's sexy. Um, we do that too, but we're talking um, a little bit more about doing a generalized based attack as opposed to a very specific targeted red team type of attack. We're going to share uh, 11 stories of our, our failures and the solutions that we found that seem to work really well to avoid those. And we're going to generalize. We're going to generalize this, and honestly, this is this stuff should be useful way outside of fishing. It should be useful in the rest of your professional life. It should be useful in your families. Um, so we're basically going to say that any effort that you're any effort you're you're uh, attempting professionally is going to involve. A certain amount of, and hopefully, and usually more than you realize, communication, collaboration, and negotiation. And I'll say something like this again, but I want you to know uh, my rule is anything in life that involves one, more than one person, it's a negotiation, whether you realize it or not. Yeah, otherwise, you're just playing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you're the expert there. Somebody's got to do it. It's your job. Somebody's got to do it. All right. So uh, red team fishing, uh, on the other hand, uh, as opposed to sort of more traditional pen test type fishing, um, we're looking for that not to test everyone. We're looking at for that for an access methodology, and it's going to be a very detailed, tailored, uh, very focused uh, attack with a very small pool of emails. Typically, one to ten, usually one to two, sometimes even just one. Um, we're going to do lots of open source intelligence, we're going to be uh, delving into finding out what attack is going to work and what attack is going to work the first time, because that's all we've got. And we need to build a lot of infrastructure around that um, with, with having uh, backstories and great pretexts and you name it. We're going to have to spend lots and lots of time for a single red team type phishing email. It may take months to construct. 
from both the email content to building uh, fake LinkedIn profiles to uh, setting up domains and, and and you name it to, to build that specific pretext. And getting those, and getting those domains to have some history behind them so that they'll make it through the uh, make it through the filters, right? right? So that they have some some provenance, as it will, uh, so that the, the, those domains that we want to use for phishing have uh, some trust based on um, use and organizational application and so forth. Um, and some of the things that we found that work really well is you need your Office 365 or Gmail, uh, Google services, uh, to use their trust uh, for all of the, the spam uh, filtering and so forth, uh, to have that reputation built by others first. Their mail servers often get white listed, so you get the email security. So, like we said, we're going to tell you 11 stories from real-life experience. Each one of them informed the way that we run our phishing engagements, and honestly, over time, they start to inform the way that we do work for clients and run our company. Um, so, as I said, we're going to give this advice as if you're either one of us, a consultant, or, whether, or if you're inside a company and you're trying to do a phishing campaign yourself. Okay. So, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Right? There's possibly no way we can have any of this fishing fail. I mean, this is this is not going to go wrong by like this cat attacking this particular balloon, right? Because you know what's going to happen here. The cat is going to jump off the door. The door is going to swing closed, or it doesn't swing closed, and they catch the balloon and plummet to the floor, or they grab the balloon and the balloon pops. And then you know what happens when the cat has the balloon that pops? It's messy. It's messy. Really messy. First hand, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, it scares, yeah, it scares the current one, literally and figuratively, sometimes. All right, so first one, I schedule failing. Um, you, you do a great job, work with your client, you get, uh, you get the test on the calendar, uh, it, it's ready to go, you talk with the client, and uh, you give them three individual pretexts. Uh, to choose from, uh, you send those over to the client, uh, the, the contact that you're working with uh, picks the context, um, you get all of that built by, by Wednesday uh, in preparation to send the email out on Friday so that uh, it's in their email boxes uh, first thing on Monday morning so that all, all the folks are, are looking at it. Um, they get it Wednesday, uh, send over all the stuff so that they can review it, um, looks good. And then you find out that uh, on Thursday, your contacts pushes the email up the chain a little bit and says to the manager, hey, this is the, this is the phishing pretext that we're going to use, and we're going to get these emails somewhere between Friday and Monday. Just a quick FYI, I, I thought I, I thought it would be a good idea to, to show it to you. Kind of like the last minute, here you go. I just want to let you see it. And the manager says, what the heck is this? You can't do this. This is, this is all wrong. Um, all our users are going to fall for this, or this is too believable, or we're going to get in so much trouble. <laughs> no, yeah, you have to start back over. Or, or this has objectionable material in the, uh, you know, you can't, you can't actually try to sell medicinal drugs to make things, you know, <laughs> or, or stand up longer, or, yeah. Are you trying to make side money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, now the manager comes back and says, no, there's no way. You start, start the pretext over, you can't use this one. Um, do this instead. And, and now that your contact comes back and says, so, uh, so Larry, Jay, uh, I'm sorry, but we have to pick a different pretext. I'm going to start from scratch. You're going to have to build a little new dynamic material. This is going to take a little while. And as a consulting firm, we're always worried about schedule because if somebody starts from scratch, all of a sudden that thing we're supposed to do next week, we're going to be doing something else, and uh, and we've got someone in the front row of this talk actually who has to manage changing us to something else. And uh, yes, which she refers to it as changing the schedule as uh, rearranging her Tetris board. Yes, because it's like where do you fit these pieces in with these players, and uh, it becomes a mess trying to juggle that stuff. But when you do this internally, if you're not us, if you're not an aspect company, you're doing this as an internal project. You might think schedule doesn't matter, and the thing is, if a project starts to run late, we all know this might be project starts to run late, it starts to lose credibility. And once that credibility is lost, you risk the project getting shut down, not repeated, or budget, or whatever. And so it's important to not, it's important to stay on time, and it's important to get it right the first time. So, yeah. so don't blow your schedule with this. And make sure that you communicate with the organizations to let them know what some of this stuff looks like. And yes, this is what happens when apparently you fail to communicate when creating some labor labeling. 
And yes, Arabic is spelled two different ways because they misspelled it one of the two times, right? Diesel fuel in Arabic and then non-smoking in Arabic. So how do we fix it? This is the opportunity for you to lead. Woo! Never thought you'd be a leader, did you? Okay. Guess what? You're going to be a leader. Okay. We need to start having uh, some conversation with uh, the folks in the organization to lead them through this from the beginning. Hey, we need to have this approved before we even start building some of this stuff. Um, let them know what you're, you're brainstorming. Uh, let them have some input into some of the, the pretext development. At the, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, even if you know, even if you're you're not a manager or, or you know you're inside a company, you're not a manager, you're just holding for what have you. You may feel like you're not the boss, right? It's not you know. But at the end of the day, you're you're the one that's responsible to get the project done and to make it work and work well. And that means you do have to stand up and lead. You have to. Someone has to stand up and say, "This is what we're going to do." And so. What we do is basically, what, what we do when we get this right is we say, okay, this is what the process is going to be, here's what the milestones are going to be, here's what has to be done by when, and by the way, you know, if this doesn't, if, if this part doesn't work right, if we don't hit that milestone, this is one of the things that's happened in the past. Um, so there are a few other, there are a few other things you find out, find out before you start creating your pretext. You can veto it, and you get them involved. And you told them the risk. And maybe give them some deadlines to figure out how long they need to get that reviewed so that you can schedule accordingly. Hey, uh, we're going to send this over to you. Um, we're going to send it to you to get to take a look at it. How long do you think it's going to take them? Can we set a deadline so that we can now continue to move forward and we sort of know what the rest of that schedule is going to look like? And give them some call to actions uh, for, for limiting that time frame for, for that approval. Make sure they know how Oh my God, and Creeper. <laughs> Wo kommt der schon wieder hergeschlingelt? Um, don't build your entire prototype of your pretext until you actually have approval. Like, don't spin your wheels building. Brauchen wir den, um irgendwas in die Luft zu jagen? Nee, nicht wirklich, oder? All the background of the pretext to find out that I just wasted 40 hours building this pretext and it's no good. Well, maybe I can use it on another client, but depending on how tailored it is to that individual client, maybe, maybe not so much. So the other part of this is basically just realize you're talking to one person, you're talking to your client, you're talking to your boss. You're in a multi-party negotiation whether you realize it or not, because your organization or your client's got a whole bunch of people. So you're in a you're in a multi-party negotiation, and it's up to you to lead it and rock it, and um, and make sure you're involved enough people. So how many of you guys are introverts in this room? Don't all raise your hands at once. I know you're being introverted, right? Yeah, that guy in the back, he's clearly an introvert, right? Yeah, he's not an introvert, he's an extrovert. They tend to raise their hands for him. Yeah. yeah. Not many, not many. Good. I, I just, and this is our don't work. And, then, and that's pretty endemic in our, in, in our industry, right? You know, I, I think a lot of the folks that I run into, that uh, they deal with technology because they don't want to have to deal with people. Well, unfortunately, we have to deal with people, right? Yeah, so some introvert pro tips. Um, it is about when you're going to communicate and ultimately the type of communication. So if you communicate more in the beginning about this whole process, the communication will be much better. You get an opportunity to sell and to lead and to have fun. Or if you don't communicate enough, you end up in these other, these last three bullets, which we all, which sucks. And it takes longer too, so it's more effort. That's, you're talking about frustrations, you're assigning blame, you're talking about why the project didn't work, you're lamenting the failure, and people are getting angry and finger pointing, and that never goes well. And it's, it's not nice, but it, it makes you not want to do this, so it makes you frustrated. So communicate more in the beginning. I can't wait until my kids start sending me Father's Day cards via email, because they're cheap. Right? I don't already do that. <laughs> See, I can't send Father's Day cards. I can't send Mother's Day cards. My father passed away. So I can't send Mother's Day cards to my mom via email. You know why? She can't use a computer. <laughs> and she took, I took it away from her. <laughs> All right. So, so what, what, what do you mean? <laughs> oh, now we can mess with the transcriptionists? No. <laughs> stop it, Jay. All right. So, did you check your spam folder? 
Yeah. What happens when your fish so so this is sound so this, is, uh, this is something that happened that, that, that used to happen to us. We actually had one of these happen to us recently. Uh, but, you know, but in our story, you spend a whole bunch of time developing that pretext landing page, you go through all the negotiations we've been talking about. None of your emails make it through the organization spam filters. At this point, the spam filters have been trained in your emails, so you don't get to use them in the future. So your spam filters trigger maybe the domain's too new, or it, it has broken it. Yeah. Or maybe just the spam filters huh? And you're back to the drawing board, schedule suckers, your contact or your contact or your boss is annoyed. Check out this pretext. Oh my god. Let's go test it. No, it doesn't work. Oh. I think it would be good. So, let's do some user testing. Uh, on our user testing, so we tested the test with some user testing. Okay, give up. Okay, this is the one technical slide we have this entire talk. So on the technical side, going through your SPF and DKIM, use a you know use an MTA that you've tested, it's had a domain for it's had a domain for at least a week, and it's been assigned to do that. And uh, yeah, it's a pro tip to your IPv6. Oh my God, I know one for all the services <laughs> as well. Uh, we recently yep. had a mail server that would do uh, SPF record. Uh, one of our clients had a mail server that did uh, SPF record lookups and preferred IPv6 over IPv4. And the IPv6 lookup would fail. And then because our SPF record wasn't appropriate, they would drop the mail as spam because it would be IPv6 and not IPv4. And it took us forever to figure out why this stuff was not making it through. So, so with that said, we like the human fix for this one. Basically, you talk to your you talk to your client, your contact, your boss, and you say you're testing the humans, not the technology. The point of we talked about red teaming and it had a different focus. But in this, you look and say, what's the overall mission? The overall mission was to get an email to everybody in the org or to a large portion of the org and see how they respond. Wuda. So if the technical solutions get in the way, uh, then you're not getting you're not actually able to do the test. So at this point, we're gonna go and ask to be whitelisted. Hey, could you just let our mail server send through? And right. Make sure that you budget time and to test the whitelist. I don't know. Then you still end up in this failure if your whitelist was set up and didn't work. Yep. So for example, this is testing the human, not the technology, because we know the technology fails. How many of you folks have a spam filtering or some type of solution in your organization? How many of you still get spam? I rest my case, right? It's broken, it doesn't always work. So it's not about testing the technology, you know you have it, you know it doesn't always work. You kind of spam. One Hi. <laughs> email to get into someone's environment or one person to click on. And you know it's gonna get there, because you know why they keep doing spam? Because it works. So. All right, math, math is hard. Find the volume and surface of the area right of the cylinder. Sushi. So, the numbers game fail. Okay. So, some, some interesting things, you know, you're gonna go do a, a fishing test and you need to have some emails to send these to. You use all of the best tools in your arsenal to go collect mail addresses from the internet. Uh, Maltigo, you, you name it, Google, uh, all of the tools that you use to populate this list of emails from publicly available sources. And you end up with 15 email addresses in a company that has a thousand employees. This is not a good test. Okay. So you are really looking to test all of the humans to see how all of the humans react to based on some of their internal training or to gauge how, what type of training that they need to do. You need a whole lot of email addresses. Fifteen is important to cut it. The, the thing is, what, the thing is, the black hats they get to brute force mail servers to find valid email addresses. They get to send you tons of spam to do that. They get to buy mailing lists, and if they're particularly questionable, this this guy named Bob, uh, they can go and say pull all the pager traffic if, the, if their client is a their client or their target. Well, not their client. If their uh, if their victim is a uh, say a hospital nearby with tons of pagers going, that'll get you some that'll get you some addresses. Yes, that'll get you some addresses. So, Matt, why are you so hard? Right? Why why does this have to be so hard? Why how can we get around this whole fifteen email address problem? 
and, and be semi-ethical about it and or do this affordably and not have to buy really expensive mailing lists and, or, or do bad things with Oxtag and flex the paper traffic. So let's just, let's, just tell the, let's just tell the client and the boss that an attacker could get a really comprehensive list of email addresses. Yeah, because we know they can. We know they can. We know they can. But well, when we say, when we tell them that, they approve it. Um, yep. I, I, I can brute force every email address at your email server. You're not going to like it. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be a bad day for your email admin. So the, the thing that, you know, the, the objection, you know, the objection that we might get from jurists is like, no, wait a second, you want this to be an accurate test. And I'll say this is where the red teams, you know, military red teams for a long time have been throwing out and saying this is our white card. Um, we're going to say let's just stipulate we can get all the email addresses you give them to us. Um, and that way we're spending our time in smarter ways. Um, so in our case, this is, this is the first place where the, the negotiation really becomes really obvious. Okay, your client may just say, no, I don't want to. And at that point, you have the opportunity to just walk away, say, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send him 15 emails. This phishing test is going to suck. And, you know, it's okay. It'll be his fault. So I don't care. But most of us, when we do anything in life, we actually care about the outcomes. And when we say, I don't care, we're usually in some kind of pain. Um, so. What we can do instead is try to get creative. We can talk to our clients and say, how about this? We'll do the first step. We'll find all the addresses we can find. And if that's 15, great. If it's 1,000, great. At the end of that, we're going to give you those addresses. We'll put them in the report. Heck, if you want, we'll do those first. But ahead of time, give us the rest of the email address of the organization. That way, we can do a comprehensive test where we know that we actually have to test a large, large enough number of users to be helpful. And you get to get that thing you want, which is that accuracy. You can kind of see both outcomes. And it won't ruin your day when you topple over your mail server by sending it too much mail. Right? And you, your email admin's going with that day for that. And you know, maybe not engaging in illegal behavior for finding uh, uh, addresses via other, other means. Okay. So you know, brace yourselves. The open floor plan office is coming. Winters. So your email, uh, let's consider a pretext. I did this once. Um, your email says you, do you consider the pretext once? I did. Okay. No, I wrote one, damn it. Okay, good. Have you been drinking again? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So the email says to Robert Smith, he's the director of information technology. You send out the director of information technology says, anybody who's given their password going to lose their job, blah, 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 this kind of thing. That's my pretext. Uh, I didn't really know my client. The whole organization sat on one floor in a very large airplane hangar style building um, <laughs> in an open floor plan. And so people just started going, walking over to Robert's desk here, at which point he alerts everybody. He told a few of them, and then one of them stands up and says, Hey, that email from Bob, don't open it! And his success rate goes to other dogs. What success rate? Yeah, yeah. So having an open floor plan has helped me bond with my coworkers who also despise having an open floor plan. Right. Okay. So know your target. You know, know what the environment looks like uh, as part of developing that pretext. Because again, you want to help the, the folks that you're testing to become better. You want to have uh, some good success and uh, not have the alerts. You want to test individual people and not have that, that alert go out necessarily so that all of the people can get tested. Talk with your client about what does the office look like? Hey, who may be a good person in the organization for us to send an email in from if it's a legitimate source? Um, what day is he going to be on vacation? So they can go over to his office and knock on his door and, uh, and see, hey, did you send that email? Now find out what he's going to be on vacation. Um, find out where people sit in the organization. Is it difficult for them to eventually go ask those, uh, those folks? Um, Talk about what their escalation procedure is for uh, getting uh, spam emails and malicious emails and those types of things. So then you can start understanding who they're going to potentially escalate it to. So maybe you can notify those people to say, hey, you just got an escalation. Good. We're doing a phishing campaign. Don't tell anyone. And see how many people report it. So um, the other big one for us that we learned was make your, make your clients or your boss or your, your contact uh, within your organization and at least one level of management above them part of the pretext brainstorm. So you catch, you catch things early. They tell you, yeah, that, that's not going to work. We all sit on one floor. They're, they're just going to walk over to Bob's office and ask 
ask him if he sent me an email. I'm, I'm going to let this one speak for itself. Okay. Okay. So here's another one I, I've gotten nailed by. Your client asks you to send an email slowly so you're going to avoid detection. Just, you know, send one, wait 10 more minutes, send one. By the time you've got 10 emails out, what's that? Now it's far an hour and 40 minutes. You've given people plenty of time and someone's going to alert security or compliance to the help desk. They send out a mass email, the jig is up. You're, you've only got 140 email addresses into the organization of 3,000 and your campaign is effectively over. That wasn't a good test of the humans. So the only time you should be doing low and slow is barbecue, Carl. Come on. That's how you do good barbecue. Low temperature, long period of time. God. What? <laughs> barbecue, barbecue, Carl, barbecue. So phishing is truly about speed. You want to get as many emails in front of people's eyes before they can collectively make a decision that this is bad and pass notifications. If you raise your organization's ability to communicate and collaborate and detect you, and they will, humans are social creatures. Oh, wait, this whole talk about communication. Right? You're, you're trying to exploit the race condition of getting your email in front of as many eyeballs as possible uh, before they start communicating internally that, hey, maybe we have a problem and start doing some reporting. Let's make sure your deadline is really soon. Don't give them two days. Don't tell them give them a day. You want to get people into the lizard brain part that's scared and has to act fast. And the other reason you want to make them act fast is to them a chance to talk to each other. Because communication is their big, their big defense. Yeah. And, and that, that's one of the other things sort of as a, as a side that we found that has worked really well um, in, the, in the fishing. If you're asking someone to perform some action, give them a call to action and have some penalty behind it. Um, hey, if you don't go to this website and put in your username and password, in the next 15 minutes, we're cutting off your access. And what happens when you cut off their access? You can't do your job. And then your manager gets mad at you. So what do they do? Oh, I gotta go do this. Before the wizard part of the brain catches up and says, this is not, where did my tail go? Oh, right. So you're exploiting that race condition. Okay, so. Is, is, is my tail sticking out? Oh. So this poor gentleman, he chose poorly. This is impact, not. He did not name that right? I remember so, he didn't do that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, dr he drank from the wrong chalice, right? Okay. So, okay. Sure. So, core domain choice. We, uh, everyone learns this one really early on. You choose a domain badly. Uh, one of the great things that most, uh, the most people, most news will try. Um, and I'm not going to admit whether I've done this too, is they will pick, uh, they'll, you know, they've got their target Eli Lilly. And we've never done work for Eli Lilly, so I felt safe for him in here. It just happened to have a company name that had lots of I's and L's that could be replaced with ones. So, you know, you try something along the lines of changing an L or an I to a one, or changing an I to an L or an L to an I. Uh, the problem is Fox Collision Attack. The problem is the employees are trained to catch this. This is like one of the few things that user awareness training does tend to get consistently right across the organization. So, Nobody's fooled, your numbers are awful, and everyone says, uh, yeah, they didn't they don't do good vision tests. You don't want that to be you. So choose wisely. Drink from the woodcutters, uh, the, uh, the carpenter's chest. Right? Not the most lavish one, because it's not the right one. Okay. So pick a really good domain. Use the, use the customer or use your name in the domain, but add additional quote entropy to it. Um, you know, in this case, uh, say Eli Lilly Benefits, um, or pick a domain that uh, you, you can use for multiple clients and then use subdomains per uh, to sort of make it look like maybe you partnered with a third party um, so that the, they now have multiple subdomains for each one of the, the, the clients and so forth. Um, and, and honestly, figure out what will work. So you're going to come up with those ideas, and before you just stand up the domain and go on ahead, um, go and talk to your client, but also go and talk to your coworkers. Um, you know, one of my coworkers is sitting in the front row downstairs, and one of the guys who got, who got me to pick better domain names and told me what kinds of things worked. And one of the coworkers uh, is also sitting in front of the guy who said, you know, well, we should use domains, we should buy domains, keep them for the long term, and start using subdomains for those. 
and um, honestly just talk to other people collaborate. That's the, the biggest thing with, so fishing is, is one of those things where we all just think, okay, it's a one person job, I'm going to sit down and do it myself, and, um, and then whatever goes wrong, you're like, oh shit, we could have avoided that. But if you talk to more people, whether it's at your clients, whether it's in your company, that collaboration ends up producing better results. Don't do it in a vacuum. So, um, so what if your client, this is where we're going to break from the story or, or talk a little bit more about the story, what if your client is the one who asks you to take their Eli Lilly domain name or what have you, change the L to a one? So the client, in fact, wants to choose poorly. The client wants to choose poorly. You know it's, you know it's not going to work. You know why it's not going to work or, or you think it's, it's really unlikely to work all that well. And now you, real, now you have to realize you're in a negotiation. You know, you can just say, uh, he made me do it. He made me pick a bad domain, so it didn't work out so well. It's all his fault. Who cares? I don't care. Yeah. It's true. You know, as, as humans, that's not what we're about. We care about what we do. Yeah. So we want to make it better. So, so realize that this effort's about collaborating, about communicating, about negotiating. So the, the easiest way to lose in a negotiation um, is to not realize you're in one. And you're basically always in one. Um, but sometimes that means that you, you have something besides just yes or no, besides just go with his idea, or to stomp your feet on your own idea, and that's to get more creative. Um, sometimes that's as simple as just saying, okay, I, I'm not really sure about that one. Before we lock in on it, can we brainstorm as part of a larger group? Can we, uh, you know, can we get some more people from your organization in? And yeah, somebody else calls, somebody else calls call on, the, on the domain, and, and that makes it easier. So more choosing poorly, right? The amount of people who has you heard is too high. Uh, so one of the ones we used to get hit with early on, our clients, the client would ask us to use broken grammar and spelling to simulate what they get. Um, you get frustrated because you know that will lower your success rate. Heck, maybe you go ahead and do it. And you send up broken grammar, you end up frustrated the client giving his company a false sense of security. So by winning, by winning the negotiation, when the client was pushing you to, when the client was, was pushing you to use broken grammar, he just lost. And that's uh, that's my number one rule of negotiating. If anyone loses, everyone loses. It's kind of like the, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. It's actually if anybody ain't happy, ain't nobody gonna be happy. So. Grammar has to be like, we all are like. Okay. All right, so communicate with the organization and tell them how exactly that happens, that the broken grammar actually reduces the effectiveness of testing the humans. You, they're trained, they know that if you're just sending email to look like it's coming from a company as part of a, a phishing campaign, uh, as to have it be somewhat legitimate, and there's incorrect grammar, do you think many people send out emails as their corporate organization as part of some marketing type of thing with incorrect grammar? Yeah. Not usually, because that probably goes through about 12 rounds of proofing. Um, and, and absolutely. Now start going and digging into your spam and showing them to the people you're working with, like, look, I just got this email, it was spam. And the grammar is immaculate. This is, this is key. You know, like if you're in that situation, the client just it seems like the client just won't listen to reason. Your goal, or your, you know, your client won't listen to reason, what have you. Your goal is to, you know, kind of take a breath, stay present, and get creative. And if you can just stick with it and try again, you'll often get a much better result. And so it's like, okay, well, tell me more about what your concern is. Why are you digging your heels in? And they say, all the stuff we ever get is broken grammar. And you say, okay, let me show you some of the stuff that I get that isn't. And that yep. and it'd be willing to uh, to do both. Send some with broken and send some with good grammar and send it to two disparate groups within the organization and see how the numbers turn out. And that's where creativity gets you that better result. Yeah. I love this one. Some cops are Jedi, they're just holding the fence back with the Jedi mind trick. So Sometimes your fish is so good that some federal authority gives you a call and said, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. So, yes. Why? Because in many of the cases, the organization that you're sending the email into uh, doesn't involve enough people to tell them that, hey, we're doing a phishing campaign. 
and then they escalate appropriately, and they escalate way too far. <laughs> so we've had this kind of thing happen a couple times, and, um, and when it happens, it usually starts with the engagement where the client says, the only people who are going to know about this fishing exercise are me and my boss. We're both on the phone. No one else is going to know about it. Not the help desk, not HR, not legal, not audit, not whoever. No one. And then what happens, they get one, it goes to some C-level manager, and the C-level manager freaks out and says, oh my gosh, this is super illegal, we need to report this. And so they contact someone and they call the IT department and the IT security guy calls and reaches out to their InfraGuard contact and next thing you know, the federal authorities are involved. Yeah, that's not a good day. Trust me, we're invisible, or invisible rather. Yeah. Nope, nope, nope. didn't see that, didn't see that. Okay. So, so like we said before, this is your project. Whether you're whether you're the outside, whether you're the outside consultant, whether whether you're a mid-level manager, whether you're the person, you know, lowest in the totem pole, nobody works for you, realize you have to leave. You make this a mandatory part of the test. When you're explaining what the test is, you manage everyone's expectations. Here are the steps in the test. We're gonna follow steps one through one through eight, and step three is you've got a you've got to involve HR and legal. And that, and that, may, that, that usually means that somewhere right there, you're going to sit down with your client and brainstorm who needs to, who might get called in the escalation, so who needs to know about this. Um, in terms of effective ways to do that, tell this story. So tell our stories and tell other people's stories. The human mind is basically set to remember stories and to pass them along, to pass this alive. So use stories. Yep. Yep. Friendly to your organization. Yep. yep. And uh, tell, tell them about, about some of the escalation tests and maybe have some of those folks at some of the top of the escalation know about the fishing test um, so, so that they can, you know, they can put off all the authorities and involving all sorts of legal actions. Okay. So, so first you don't succeed, fail, fail again. <laughs> yeah, I love that the cat. All right. So, so the story of the unhappy client, right? You do this awesome fishing campaign, you have a high success rate. Or depending on what success is for your career customer or for the people you're working with, the, the, the outcome for the fishing campaign was fantastic. We got in front of a bunch of eyes and they didn't fall for it because they had great training, or they did fall for it because they had really poor training. And then you start writing the report and you're, you're almost done with the report, you're ready to turn it into the client and they said, hey, did you guys finish the test? Uh, um, like two weeks ago? Uh, yeah. And maybe, or maybe just otherwise, you just, you did the, you do the test, you achieve great results, you feel like it was totally successful, and your, and your client, um, your client that you're outside, or your boss just feels like it, the effort didn't go well, they didn't feel the Hey, how many results? Hey, how many results? That's the other one. Hey, how many results? Hey, how many results? What if your client or somebody calls you every 30 minutes, you're trying to get your own job done, you're trying to do the fishing, and you keep getting all these phone calls, what do you do about it? How many results? Yeah. Success. <laughs> All right. Happy client is a good client. Right? A good client is a happy client. Okay. Set some expectations about the types of communication you're going to give to them during the engagement. Um, manage their expectations. Hey, I'm going to give you some, some updates you know, a couple of times on the first day because it's typically when a lot of the results come in. Uh, and then we're going to, I'm going to call you end of day tomorrow and uh, I'll call you the end of the day after that to you know how many results. Uh, and then uh, we'll let you know when it's over, and you know when it should be over the call to action. Uh, but some people are still going to do stuff after the call to action, so we'll let you know when some of these come in while we're writing the report. Uh, so next thing you know, we're going to write the report, we'll tell you when the report will be there. Um, set the stage for when you're going to do the communication so there's no surprises. Manage expectations. And then finally, empathize with your client. Your client usually has been rooting for this for a long time, or your boss has been rooting for some kind of security test for a long time because they think that there's something to be worried about. Don't reinvent the wheel. Okay. Don't do this every time you do a fishing campaign if you do multiple. Even if you're doing it in your own organization, retain the infrastructure that you built and fix the infrastructure based on lessons learned from your engagement. Don't spool this up every time. Uh, what we found many years ago is that when we were doing this stuff, every one of our, our uh, consultants would spool up new infrastructure for every test, and every one of them did it differently. And everyone had different problems. We weren't learning anything. Yeah, so we were too busy trying to fix problems. So we want you to fail more. It's just so innovative. Right? 
Street makes you know this stuff. The fix is either use existing good free tools you like fish and frenzy a lot, or develop your own. And whatever you choose, lock in on it for a while and teach everybody how to use it. Maybe even record that. Maybe even record when you teach everybody how to use it. So you can get everybody on the same page. And that means that every assessment you do after that makes you better at doing this. Because now if you build any new if you build on the infrastructure, you're building a capacity you didn't have before. Yep. So automate and script it so that you can reuse it multiple times. I love this one. This is a red. My name is not Dave. It makes, makes no sense. sense. Microwave. Okay. Like, what, what? 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 What are you talking about? Exactly. We, we have, have no idea what we're talking about because we didn't follow up with the right people after the engagement to see how they thought it went. And what they and what did they do after the campaign? And this is one we didn't even know was a failure. This is one we didn't even know we were failing at. Because we had an unknown hard error. Right? We had no idea what, what their outcome was. And we learned when a client called us and started calling us about the results of fishing. They said, okay, ever since you, ever since you did that fishing, you've raised our reporting rates, you've reduced our click rates, because they're still testing it. And they said, we're getting higher report rates, we're getting, we're getting what we want. And I said, good. I've never bothered to ask a client before how that worked out for them. Like, I'd come back to a year later, but I didn't ask them for specific numbers. And um, yeah, find out. Yeah. So needless to say, we've gotten a lot of frustration with fishing to the point that uh, Mr. Greeley used to have hair. And I pulled it all out. All of it. Okay. So the overall lesson, what's the takeaway? Fishing is all about collaboration. Okay. Again, if you're having a conversation with two people, you're having a negotiation whether you know it or not. Jay and I negotiated several times on this stage. We did, we did, and before here, and with Zoom. So most of the failures, most of the failures we've been describing are failures either to think ahead, and communicate, collaborate, and lead. Okay, ich mache hier kurz einen Cut, um, so weil die Episode ist schon lang und Ende laufen ist ein bisschen blöd. Wie immer hier auf Laser Gurkenland am Spielen und wir haben den Talk gepumpt, äh, DEFCON 24, Fish, Fishing Without Failure and Frustration. Der ist jetzt auch äh, vorbei, ähm, dann sehen wir uns in der nächsten Folge.